film to be tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Research on iron riches in Belgium in the first half of the 19th century. And I came across digitalized postcards representing, representing an iron bridge at Chaufontaine in Belgium across the Vestre River, not far from Belgium. I never had before had seen or had overlooked illustrations of such kind of bridges. And I began to dig into the literature about that bridge. Is it correct? Probably correct. Yes. Because it's, it's not in that way. And the first occurrence that um, in modern literature that I found was found in the, in the several the British papers published by John James, and especially this paper right here at the Science Museum in 1981 where he gives a drawing of that Chauvin bridge here, number 30, but with very little indication and no source. Considering all the information that I found on bridges of that time, it's quite clear that James missed it at his, in his times. I did some research in archives, but most of the information that I found comes from digitalized material that is no available to download from national libraries like the National Library of France or Google Books. And let's see what I discovered. On uh, the 5th of September 1850, Jean-Louis Vernet, an inventor from Lyon, filled a 15-year patent for a system of, I quote, suspension bridges, to which he gave the name of Pont d'Hercule, or Hercules bridges. These are arched bridges of a new typology for France, because the bridge deck is suspended from the arches, from two parallel arches made from cast iron voussoirs. And the arches are therefore located above the deck. The suspenders are in low iron. Uh, the patent application is illustrated by two plates, one of which represents the design of a 225 meter long bridge with three, two, or even a single uh, arch uh, span, and the construction of a 70 meter arch span iron arch, uh, which is the least daring of the three solutions, would already have been a technological feat in France in the 1850s. So the promotion of this type of bridge therefore proceeds on the inventor's part from an utopian project with little knowledge on the constructive re reality of bridges. In fact, very little is known about this inventor, sometimes referred as an engineer in some documents. And the database of 
19th century French patents attribute 21 of them between 1832 and 1866. And the Hercules Bridges, uh, this patent that he filled in 1850 while he was living in Lyon, uh, was his 14th patent. And it's its first patent related to construction because all previous ones uh, were more related to machinery or industry. <coughs> the word suspension is probably deliberately chosen because the inventor proposes in the justification of his invention annexed to his patent application to compete effectively with the suspension bridges whose use has become widespread in France since their introduction 25 years earlier, and whose chronic weakness is also well known. And the failure of the Angers suspension bridges um, four weeks before filling the, uh, sorry, four months uh, before filling the patent, uh, causing more than 200 casualties, deeply shot in France and will be abundantly recalled during the promotion of the new structural type. It should be underlined that in fact the second, it's uh, the second uh, plate of the patent, but it, it is in an addition. It should be underlined that the structure of these arches uh, have uh, as interesting and useful aspects, but also illogical and even counterproductive details. The inventor most probably realized, at least intuitively, that these very frail arches could exhibit stability problems that had to be contained. In the transverse direction, there is every reason to fear lateral buckling. And this is fought in two ways. First, by providing a wind bracing, which is some elements here of wind bracings, in the form of a few crossing beams connecting the two arches together. And also by giving to the arch section a, a, a shape, taking into account the need for stiffness in the transverse direction. In the 1850 patent, the transfer stiffness was provided by an H-shaped section, but in this addition submitted in 1852, the lateral stiffness is provide, provided by a ridge, a rib arranged per perpendicular to the plane of the arches. You see this rib plane. Um, and this design provision was applied to all uh, vernier bridges which were built. In the longitudinal direction, the inventor planned to have small secondary uh, arches. Um, but results we specified their exact functions in the patent. Of course, one hypothesis is that the inventor might have hoped to stiffen the arches. But from a modern structural point of view, we can consider that these arches are completely, completely ineffective. Since they transfer their thrust to the top of pies, which were initially designed in masonry, and uh, which therefore would be very unable to sustain such kind of loading. Anyway, the whole structure cannot be denied a uh, light character and even some aesthetic value for the time. The detailed design of the apron railing and also of the deck, which was a thin wrought iron sheet, is also given in the pattern. Any new bridge type 
any new invention requires a prototype and a load testing. And it will be the Saint-Clément bridge over the Lignon River near saint etienne le mola and that's in the Loire department. Vernier was awarded in February 1851 the uh, contract for the construction of a bridge according to his system for a lump sum of 30,000 francs. And the loading and receiving test on the 26th of August 1852 was carried out in, a pres in the presence of an unusual gathering of very high ranking witnesses like the prefect of the department, the engineering chief of the department. The official in charge of the roads of the department worked a detailed and laudatory report, which was subsequently widely used to promote the system. The span of this bridge was about 31 meters, and the loading, three piles of sand, represented a total of nearly 76 tons, or about 450 kilo per square meter of projected area, which is the double that was more than twice that, that uh, than was required for the uh, load testing of suspension bridges. And this bridge possibly survived at least until 1939. With the, the success of this uh, test loading of the bridge over the Lignon, Vernier, who wants to replace suspension bridges with bridges according to his system, uh, can start a vast promotional campaign. And a renowned landscape a painter and lithographer from Lyon, Nicolas Victor Fonville, is said to have, and I quote, reproduced in a very cleverly designed landscape the Lignon Bridge, end quote. Uh, it can be confidently assumed that the artist was commissioned by Vernier and that this little half was distributed as a promotion material. As an indication of its wide promotion, this copy is owned by the Bologna City Museum in Italy. So clearly the Vernier Bridge was intended, intended as a road bridge for light service, but it's interesting <coughs> nevertheless to recall the state of the art in France at that time in cast iron arch bridge construction. The largest cast iron arch bridges built or projected around 1850 are first this railroad bridge over the Loire near Nevers with seven span of 42 meters still existing. Um, and secondly, this large railroad, railroad bridge with seven span of 60 meters across the Rhone River near Tarascon. So both bridges have been designed by the same engineer. And also the voussoir has been cast at the same iron works. For Chambourg, that's in the Nièvre department. And I will come back to this important ironworks company later. By the autumn of 1852, many articles, probably written by commissioned writers, appeared in journals and in the engineering press praising the invention of Vernier and the Hercules bridges. In November 1852, the weekly, the gave a breathtaking account of the inauguration of the Lignon Bridge <coughs> and the festivities that followed, but above all published a view of a very large Vernier Bridge project that would over the Saône River in Lyon with a single arch thrown between the Fourvière Hill and the Chartreux Plateau. 
Of course, that's a European project which was never realized, but which clearly meant nothing is impossible with the new system. And I should say that also a bit of my interest for this research stems from the fact that my father-in-law comes from the War Department, not from the Indian Commission, and that my wife, who is in the audience, is French, and she is a native from Lyon. So we sometimes go to Lyon to uh, visit the family. In France at that time, also in other countries, the financing of road bridge, road bridge construction was often done by the concession, by the state, or by local public authorities, to individuals or to private companies of the right to collect tolls to cross bridges. Vernier Grandiose project to replace suspension bridges with cast iron bridges needed the creation of a company to study, to finance, and to, and to implement the projects. And we know that as early as January 1853, he had moved to, from Lyon to Paris and was seeking the support of prominent engineers to create a company. So this company, uh, Compagnie Française de Fonds Vernier, how you always call it a company, uh, was constituted on, in May 1853 in the office of the Notary Casini Noël in Paris. And the company had uh, its headquarters in Paris and the founding partners and the first managers were Vernier and also certain Gautier, both from Lyon. So this is followed by a call to subscribe uh, for the company's share to constitute its capital. And this capital is set at 10 million francs, but the uh, initial subscription, which was closed on the 6th of June 1853, was only intended to raise one-fifth of the capital, or 100 francs, uh, per 500 francs share. The advertising for this subscription can be found in many newspapers in France, but also, it's important, uh, in Belgium. So, the subscription gave rise to some speculation, which is in fact not surprising given that the company took care to present as an argument for subscription to its capital, the fact that it was at that time negotiating to build a 700 meter long bridge over the Seine at Codebec or Pau for a lump sum of 3,750,000 francs. Of course, that's a pharaonic project, if ever was one. I quote, translate and quote, this work will, from journals, uh, this work will consist of four parts. The first bridge between the hill and the pile on the river bank shall cross over the roads and the houses with a span of 85 feet. Then um, a second uh, bridge shall jump over the river with a single span of 250 meters, leaving a free passage for the sailing ships. Then a third bridge of 85 meters will continue the slope and nine successive bridges, each 30 meter long, will gently bring this slope to the plain. This monumental bridge was obviously never built. Uh, 250 meters, if I compare this with the largest suspension bridges of that time, typically, the, if I take the, um, the Menai Bridge is 107, the main span is 176 meters. Uh, the bridge in Fribourg in Switzerland, built in 1836, is 273. Uh, and the Clifton Suspension Bridge is uh, to, uh, about 240 meters. So it's a bit larger than the largest suspension bridge of that time. 
but of course it's highly unrealistic. At the end of 1853, the Conseil des Ponts et that's an official body in France, approved officially the Vennet Bridge system, authorizing the company to erect bridges wherever it deemed it appropriate. And among other forms of support from this official body, it is worth mentioning the secondment to the company, which began in early 1854, of two of its engineers, the engineer in chief, um, Jean Francois Vauclin, and the junior engineer, uh, Jean Puyguin. Uh, this, is, this means, in fact, that the Antwerp Ecole Polytechnique in 18. Um, then and the Ecole des Ponts Chaussées in 1812, and this one and the Ecole des Ponts Chaussées in 1842. In 1854, Vauclin, who is now working for the company, published a technical memoir on the Vernier bridges. So uh, this is one of the plates of this of the plates of this memoir. So Vauclair has therefore to be considered as the company scientific expert for the structural analysis of the Vernier bridges. But it is especially important to highlight the important treatment given to the Vernier bridges by Bresse also an uh, engineer of bridges and roads, but also known as a reader at the Ecole Polytechnique and Ecole des Ponts Chaussées, in his famous treatise on curved elements, also published in 1854. In fact, Vauclin, on the same year, in his uh, memoir referred to formulas established by <coughs> This is the, the play from the book of Bresse, uh, reading this, this chapter you see here before. It's quite intricate from a mathematical point of view, I should say. Bresse goes into the, the detail of the analytical derivation of the forces in various arches, primary and secondary. Todenter and Pearson, in their well-known and voluminous History of the Theory of Elasticity, published in 1893, traced this analysis by Bress. So we could therefore assume that the Vernier bridges, at least after the Lyon, which was probably empirically designed, uh, after the Lyon bridge, the Vernier bridges were designed rationally with the um, the theory set up by Bress. The company shareholders are invited to make their second payment, payment of 100 francs uh, per share on the 15th of May 1854, and the shares of 500 francs, paid up by 200 francs, were issued on. 18, um, the 15th of May, 1854, signed by uh, Bernier and Gautier, the managers, and by Vauclin here as representative of the supervisory board, or it's somehow the board of directors, board of administration. <coughs> um, nice layout for this chair. Uh, this representation of the Lignon bridge on the four sides. At that time, it was the only Vernier bridge that had been built. Eighteen fifty-four is the year in which the company got several concessions and one contract. On the 29th of July 1854, an imperial decree allowing the company to build two tall bridges uh, at Ile Le Vinois and at Esbly, uh, sorry, two bridges at Moyon, 
on the same same day another imperial team the company to build other two other tall bridges in the same department. And the day after, that's a ministerial decision, allowing the company to build a bridge over the Bone River at Pondemann, that's in the drone department. And uh, in November, an imperial decree allowing the company to build a bridge over the Seine River at saint one a bit downstream of Paris. Um, in blue are bridges which were actually built uh, for these four bridges, it has been established that they were not built, in fact, in the Vernier system, but in another system of glass iron bridges. So, all these, this one is the only one uh, for which the company was uh, not older, if I should say, of the uh, concession. Uh, for this one, uh, the company is building a bridge for uh, someone else. And all the other bridges are, I should say, around Paris. So this bridge is the you know, about in the Drone Department. A bridge at Bondemann in the Drone Department. The second Fermi Bridge, eight. So the General Council of the Drone Department had already in the year before, in April 1853, issued a favorable uh, decision for the re reconstruction of a failed suspension bridge by 55 meter, a span Vernier Bridge, at this place, at this location, which marks, in fact, the boundary between the Drone Department and the Isère Department, uh, with the consent of the concessionaire. And following this deliberation, this ministerial decision of July uh, 1854 authorized the company to build this bridge in this system, which was done. So, and this bridge over the Bourbon River existed at least till um, 1942, perhaps later. At Saint-Ouen, in the downstream of Paris, there is an island dividing the Seine River into two branches. And we have found evidence, but no illustration, that a two-span Vernier bridge was built on the Saint-Ouen site. Uh, the spans were 65 meters and were probably the largest very just ever did. The bridge was completed and load tested in November 1856. However, with the, uh, to increase the width of the bridge, the very arches were already dismantled in 1863, and the two-span bridge was replaced by a four-span bridge with cast iron arches of 32 meters but from a different system. There is no doubt that the company fought to propose the, the construction of bridges of its system in various places. And I read in the newspaper that the company had already analyzed 130 projects by August 1855. But, of course, only the accidental discovery of documents in local archives will reveal these projects which did not proceed. The municipal archives of Nantes, for instance, contain a proposal by the company made on its own initiative in June 1855 to build for a lump sum of uh, 530,000 francs, this Ododin bridge, a bridge with four spans of 36 meters to cross the branch of the Loire, known <coughs> as the Madeleine, but the city council of Nantes, Midland. Cash flow problems seem to have arisen 
as early as December 1854. Because the company opened up a subscription for uh, 12,500 shares of 100 francs, that means in fact uh, 1 million to uh, 150,000, uh, more than the initial capital. And Vernier transfer, transferring the right attached to his patent into certificates, which, which were only available to former shareholders in good standing for the first two installments. But the problem seemed even more critical at the end of 1855. The general meeting of shareholders on the 6th of December acknowledged the resignation for Elf problem of Gautier as co-manager and the, the appointment of Vauclin as co-manager with Vernier. It also appointed Emile <coughs> Martin and Bibas a banker to the supervisory board. This meeting also decided on a new capital call to which all attending shareholders subscribed. Um, the newspaper, typically the Belgian newspaper, Indépendance uh, Belge, um, gives details the name and the capacities of the members of the board at that time. I will not go into the detail. Maybe I, shall, I should recall you what's the the political situation in France at that time. So the monarchy has been abolished in 1848. It has been a, the Second Republic uh, began in 1848. Uh, Prince Louis Bonaparte was the first elected uh, president uh, in 1848. But in 18 52, the regime changed, and the regime became the Second Empire. So from 1852, that's the Second Empire. Uh, and of course, then the, emperor, the emperor is Napoleon III, and he was the nephew of Bonaparte, of course. Uh, the only interesting guy in that list is Emile Martin, the, an iron, iron master at Fourchambeau. Uh, you see that the other one has no technical expertise. He's the only engineer. Besides, no, the Fulcline is no longer in that list. I'm sorry, uh, that's a, a bit of a problem. But anyway, so who is Martin? It's, a, it's an important person. Um, he uh, first, of course, he's a Probably he was the largest shareholder because he had some, he had some interest in, in, uh, in the business. Um, at the general meeting of uh, February 6, 1856, Vernier and Vauclin resigned as managers. And a certain Fourier was appointed manager of the company, but two days later only. Fourier resigned in turn and the supervisory board accepted Vernier and Vauclin proposal to take over the management temporarily. And a new general meeting was then held on uh, 27 of February, which appointed Emile Martin as sole manager of the company. So Emile Martin is an engineer, graduated from uh, uh, the Android Ecole Polytechnique in 1812. He was the uh, technical director of uh, this iron works at Fourchambeau in the Nerve Department from 1825 to 1854. Uh, 50, he was also, but that's in the political sphere, um, a member of the elected a member of the parliament in 1848. Uh, in 1854, he buys uh, an ironwork plant in Sireuil, and that's in the Charon department. And in that plant, he will develop with his son, one of his two sons, the, uh, the process called uh, Martin's uh, process to produce steel. Or uh, Siemens Martin, known also as Siemens Martin. So, but the, the, 
they, they were working together, but generally the, um, the, the invention of the process is attributed to the son of Emil Martin. And he had a second son, uh, who was a bridge builder, or gas diamond bridge builder. And of course, uh, uh, Emil Martin will, will also work with his second son. Uh, from 1857 to 1863, as builder of Gaston and George. So there is this general meeting in February 1856, which appointed Emil as sole manager of the company and where the attending shareholders agreed to pay the unpaid three-fifths of the sub initial <coughs> subscription in exchange of bonds issued by Martin. He later tried to legally enforce <coughs> all initial subscribers to fulfill their financial commitment, but without success. So in 1858, he was forced to sell the company assets in five lots. The Saint Juan Bridge, built at that time, with the right to collect the tolls. The concession of the two Moyen bridges, and the not yet built, of the two other bridges not yet built, and a, a fifth bridge, probably a concession of which have been obtained, not yet built, and of the, the rights of the Vernier patent. Um, the first auction closed on the 17th of May 1858, does not seem to have reached the price level of the lots. So this is why a re-auction was organized with the closing of the submission um, in July, with a seriously reduced price for the assets, except for the price of the patents, which is increased, but they have, they have no value. It should be noted that the saint Juan bridge was eventually bought by Martin himself, and that the bridges unbuilt at the time of the auction were la later erected by the company of Georges Martin, uh, his eldest son. So these Martin bridges and the bridge at saint Juan, all in gas uh, were destroyed during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And the company was finally put into liquidation in 1874. And in his notebooks, Louis Martin is bitter and accusatory. He says, in the case of the Vernier, Vernier Bridge business, I was indignantly misled by the Marquis d'Autrepoul, the pseudo Noël des Notary, Vauclin, my four comrades, from Pontique and Gautier itself. Now it's time to discuss the diffusion of the system outside of France, but I will put it in a short answer. A notice insert, inserted in various issues of a legal journal in December 1854 and 18, January 1855 indicates that Vernier held patents in 31 states or countries, uh, which of course means that the company hoped to promote the system outside France. With the promotion of these bridges by the inventor of the as soon as the Lignon Bridge was received. And I have immediately to say that I've uh, found no mention whatsoever of any bridges in the UK or even in the UK press or journals. <coughs> so Germany first. The system does not seem to have been successful in Germany after states, various states of Germany at that time, and from the paper on the advantages of the Hercules bridges published in uh, 
Dingler's Polytechnic Journal by Gilles de Codander in 1853. Uh, this is a translation of a paper that had been written in French in 1852 by this uh, senior bridges and road engineers who seems to have been one of the very first engineers to praise the merits of the Vernier Bridge system. I also found uh, that the archives of the Lander of Saxony are out. I've kept some documents related to the Vernier system dating from 1853, that's possibly the material supporting the patent application in that Lander. And also, um, this seems to be the case for the archives of the Lander Baden-Württemberg. And note the date. It's uh, February, March 1853. That means before the constitution of the company. Italy. And the Austrian Empire. It's not a, yet Italy at that time. Uh, the personal archives of the Austrian, but born in the Trentino, engineer Luigi Negrelli, or Alois Negrelli, contain a correspondence dated January 1853, containing the official report of the <coughs> test of the Union <coughs> Bridge and a call to support the launch of the company to finance the construction of the Vernier Bridge itself. So at that time, Trentino was part of the Austrian Empire. There are also early references in some Italian journals and books to this new bridge system. And it is reported that the Italian market for these bridges are being prospected by, uh, sorry, the bottom of the slide is missing, uh, by a French engineer named Chabert. And he would have succeeded in obtaining a contract to build a 200 meter long bridge over the Lembo River, that's uh, in Caymon, and the cons construction of which could have begun in, a possibly have begun in 1854. And there is also a mention of a project to build a bridge over the Magra River, mm -hmm. that's the border between Tuscany and Liguria. But it has not been possible to establish if these bridges have actually been built, probably not. Spain, as in, it is the case in other countries, the most important national journal devoted to public works, the uh, de Otras Publicas. <laughs> reproduced in 1854 the minutes of the reception of the bridge over the Lido. And the journal La Illustration publish, publishes a sketch derived from the lithography by Fonville. It's not exactly the same, the detail. Uh, also in 1854. In the next issue of the Revista de Obras Publicas, uh, engineers Andres Mendizabal uh, presents a project for a Vernier bridge with a span of 68 meters to be built on the Cuiserca River in Valladolid. It was never built. Um, and other systems uh, of bridges were conserved um, in Spain at that time by a commission and notably the bowstring bridges, bridge type which have been introduced by Brunel uh, at Windsor, if I'm correct. It is interesting to mention that a model at a scale 1 to 30 of the Lignon bridge probably made in 1854, is kept in the collection of models of the Polytechnical School of Madrid. It has been restored for presentation at an exhibition of historical models held in the summer of uh, 2017 at the uh, Escuela de Caminos of Madrid. 
And several similar models of the linear bridge have probably existed because it is known that one of such models was, was exhibited at the, uh, by the company at the Paris International Exhibition in 1855. In 1859, uh, Nicolas Valdes presented in his monumental manual de Vinteneco a project for a large vernier bridge over the Rio Pacific in Manila. Of course, never built. It was not an actual project, but just an academic example. Compared with uh, projects of bridges from a little type. And now, finally, we arrive in Belgium. That's the starting point of this research. It is in Belgium that the Vernier Bridge found its most re remarkable applications outside France. Two such bridges were built there. The Vernier patent was registered in Belgium in September 1852 very shortly after the test of the Lignon Bridge. The promotion of the system then began by uh, with Bernier sending the report of the test of the Lignon Bridge to the editorial committee of the Annal des Travaux Publics de Belgique, uh, which published it in, in its volume 1853-1854. The royal decree in October 1854, granted to the Bucqua Company of Brussels the concession of those for 40 years for a bridge to be built according to the Vernier system in, uh, over the Vestre River in Chaufontaine, replacing a bridge washed away in September 1850. And the same Bucqua contractor received uh, in December 1858, the concession of tolls for 90 years to build a bridge over the Meuse River in La Meche in the Bernier system. The bridge at Chaufontaine looks very much like the bridge over the Lignon built seven years earlier. Its span may be estimated at around 33 meters. John James assumed that the Cochrane a company built the bridge, which is quite plausible given the importance of this ironworks company established in Surah just a few kilometers away from Chaufontaine. So um, the public authorities bought the bridge in 1881 and the toll was then abolished. And the bridge was swept away by a flood of the first river in uh, January 19. 40. That's 105 years ago. Tomorrow. <laughs> now, some words about the second Belgian Vernier Bridge, the bridge at three spans over the Meuse, each 36 meters long. The concession was for uh, awarded for uh, 200,000 francs. The works began in 1859 and the bridge was commissioned in February 1861. Iron parts were cast at Pockreeds, that's established. It should be noted that the pylons have no longer been masonry, but also cast iron. Um, the toll, which was lucrative, uh, was abolished in 1895 and by 1892, it had become clear that the bridge, which was single track 2.5 meter wide, and with alterna alternating traffic, was becoming insufficient to accommodate increasing traffic. So a second bridge behind here uh, was built and put into service in 1912, although this picture is from 1909. It took some time to build that one. And both were destroyed uh, in 1914 during the war. No, I have some conclusions. 
I have told in this lecture the story of the Vernier Bridge, a bridge type and a financial venture. In the least is that it was not a success story. As far as I found, only five bridges of this type were actually built between 1852 and 1861, three in France and two in Belgium. And it's important to raise the question of the reasons to, for this failure. If we go back to the paper by John James that I mentioned at the beginning, we found that cast iron arch bridges where the deck is supported, uh, I would say, or suspend, suspended from the arches, had been built or projected outside France well before 1850, when Vernier filled his patent. And incidentally, I also found uh, this project for a bridge in Brussels um, of a similar type uh, by a Belgian engineer called um, in 1845, and this project is of course not realized and it's also not mentioned by James. But in France, such, such kind of bridges had apparently not existed before Vernier, <coughs> but it's quite late by comparison with similar bridges of <coughs> In 1859, the French engineering journal Nouvelles Amères de la Construction strongly, strongly condemned cast iron bridges and Verbier bridges in particular. And in 1861, the same journal indicated, I quote, that upper arch bridges with suspended deck, known as Verbier bridges, are nowadays almost forgotten, end quote. Badois, who is an engineer writing on the re reconstruction of cast iron bridges destroyed around Paris during the Franco-Prussian War, adds, quote, <coughs> only a few bridges have been built in the Vernier system to which can be attributed more than one imperfection, end quote. But these imperfections are not explained. On the other hand, I sh it should be noted that the, the French bridges over the Lignon and the Bourg rivers lasted until the Second World War, and that the two Belgian bridges had existed until 18, uh, 1914. So the reasons for the abandonment uh, are therefore to be found as well as possible technical weaknesses. The reasons found for replacing the saint ouen bridge after the less than 10 years of operation, or to justify the duplication of the Namesh bridge in 1906, point to a first objective reason for abandoning Vernier bridges. Their inability to accommodate increasing traffic and probably also heavier traffic certainly on main roads. Above all, it should be remembered that the 1950s saw, so particularly in France but also in Belgium, the rapid and growing introduction of road iron for construction of beam bridges. Where, whether these were plate murders, reconstituted by means of hollowed plates and angles, or lattice beams, such as the key bridge in France, for example. And of the method of assembling the elements become the, then the hot rivet instead of the bolt, which was used for casting. Road iron, which has better mechanical characteristics than cast iron and rows. other sh structural shapes than the arch, uh, has become industrially available in large quantities, and the use of cast iron for bridges becomes rapidly obsolete in France and Belgium. Maybe not everywhere, but at least in these countries. And for the financial failure of the company, we can certainly add causes related to its management. 
The company was launched with a lot of advertisement and unrealistic arguments that led to unhealthy speculation. It soon appeared that the company was undercapitalized, but its status did not favor a capital increase. The supervisory board, the equivalent of a modern board of directors, was composed mainly of notables um, with all technical or industrial skills, whose main quality seemed to have been their proximity to the imperial power and the fame of their titles. The question of the guilty support of the elite and the corps des bons chaussées which commits the state's moral guarantee towards the shareholders is also to be noted. So in the bankruptcy of the company, all the shareholders, not just a new lifetime, had probably to lose their investment. It's actually for Well, that's a truly fascinating story. And, and uh, it's also delightful that you, you, you mentioned John James, who of course was a member of the society, uh, and uh, that's, that's a, a, a lovely illusion and very welcome here. Can I make that oh, yeah. Do, please, Julia. Could I, could I get, I mean, John James, who some of us knew very well and deep and admire enormously, was the most generous man with his knowledge and information ever. And even if he didn't know very much about the bridge that he found, he included every image, every reference, in the hope that somebody like you was going to come along and pick the information out and run with it. And that was one, wasn't it? That was one of the things he was really interested in doing, and I think it's incredibly true that actually here we are, some 30 years after his death, still thinking about it. You are his legacy. 38 years later. Yes. And talking of welcome, I would also like to mention uh, members of the uh, uh, of the Structural History Group. I think there are one or two here. So uh, this is very promising for a debate. Can I be really cheeky and ask the first question? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Cast iron is not good under tension. What do you think? as a civil engineer of this design, given that it would be subject to tension and points, and points of stress? Um, from structural point of view, I said it in the beginning, uh, so the logical aspect it is it's not a good, it's not a good design. Even if Brest did a, a serious structural analysis of it, it's not, not, not a sound design. <laughs> you weren't tempted to do a finite element analysis no. of it. <laughs> no, you have this, this is a bit curious. You have these secondary arches um, with a truss acting here on top of a masonry. So that's a bit curious. If this is in compression or if it's in tension anyway, this puts this uh, pylons into bandwidth. Yeah. Besides, uh, normally, if the arch is well <coughs> following some old funicular curve, the this transfer displacement of the uh, of any of the points is not very important. So I do not see very much the interest of these uh, elements. It's it's, oh, oh, it's decoration. Decoration. It's a bit fancy. But <laughs> How do they allow for elastic deformation of the bridge deck? Once <laughs> the load came on it, how was it allowed to bend? Oh, but it's been, it's quite flexible. I mean, it's 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 that uh, it does no difference at all. So it's uh, it's suspended with the rod iron rods, but this has a very uh, has, has no difference, no bending. Yeah. <laughs> there's Frank and there's some civil engineers. Frank first. Okay, not a civil engineering question, but it is also civil engineering question. Um, following up on Jonathan's point, the, the people you're talking about have portrayed as sort of the really elite French institutions, Ecopolitique and so on. 
And the received story in this country, at any rate, is that these people were really, really good at designing uh, bridges and, and sort of compared to sort of the English sort of empirical way. This, what you've indicated is that actually this isn't, actually, this isn't really the case. That, um, these bridges weren't properly mathematically analyzed in the way that one would expect, according to the received story, bridges to be analyzed. So is there, is there, are you saying something about the role of the French education system for engineers here? Initially, the, the bridge welding, there is a patent by Philip, by an inventor, which who for me has received no formal education. And it's, uh, this uh, patent is his very first patent in the field of construction. Before that, he was working in, for the spinning machines in the machinery in Lyon. So he, when he filled his patent, he has absolutely no experience in design of bridges. And he has no, I believe, no formal education. After that, so it seemed to be at that time, um, in the 1852, uh, it received, uh, the, the test loading was successful. And then the system was justified by the, um, the, the best educated engineers of the time, Bress in particular, giving some kind of caution. He performed probably a very sound structural analysis, but this analysis does not take into account Buckingham problems, stability problems at all. Buckingham problems, it's only a derivation of forces, highly statical indeterminate systems, mainly consisting of patches. So, um, but, uh, okay, yeah, I think. That's a bit my reaction. It, 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 after that, it was, but you see, all the, the bridges which were actually built have about the same size. Bit. And I assume that some tables were prepared for uh, giving the shapes to the voussoirs, the, the depth of the voussoirs according to the, the span. But this could be everything standardized, some point. Can we come back from it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a gentleman there, and then John. John? Yes. Um, he, did, he did build one bridge that had several spans, I think, which over the uh, mirrors of yes. the yeah. And then the secondary arches would have done something, because each of them would butt it against the other one. Yes, so that's great. But uh, of course, as soon as they do that, they start imposing a point note on the main line, which is hardly a desirable thing. Was this not realized at the time? Um, I must confess that I have not been into the detail of press formula and press analysis. It's a bit, um, although I'm teaching structural analysis, this is the kind of structural analysis I no longer perform. <laughs> <laughs> I was, when I, of course, when I was educated at the university, I, I was taught the rest formula. But this is, there's a, it's about 20 pages of derivation of it. So. <laughs> it did look as if one of his programs was influenced on. I'm not sure, was it or was it? As I told, I'm sorry, I have not been educated. <laughs> but I can, I, I could do it. John, thank you for an absolutely wonderful paper. One of the big problems uh, for us in England is that, it's probably going to be controversial, is that we're very bad at looking at European technology. So to actually see and hear about Europe, the, the adoption of European technology in Europe is, is fascinating. Are you aware of the bowstring arches, arch bridges that were built in the UK? Because there are two almost identical bridges in design to this, built 1827, 1829. Yes. Bowstring. What's that? You mean bowstring? 
Most of yeah. There are two most remarkable yeah. bridges built by this, which are basically seen by most contemporary writers as being the first successful ones. Mm -hmm. Napier shows a, a sketch of it, uh, and then George Leather produces two bridges very, very soon after this, 1827, 1829, and then produces two more bridges in the 1830s, one which survived through to the 18, uh, 19, 1980s. Um, so seeing this one here, what is interesting here is looking at the photographs, he seems to have used a very, very small modular element that each of the rings seems to be cast identical and then bolted together, yes. which would be a serious structural weakness in the bridge. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that the secondary arches are much more related to the, the deck hanging yes, yes. than they yeah. are to yeah. actually provide them, because yeah. they're occurring at about the third point where if you've yes. got arch failure you get a joint you get a rotation joint mm -hmm. forward. So you're probably not carrying that much of a lateral load. Yeah. Yes. But you are right in saying that it helps also to to suspend, uh, especially in other bridges, not in that one, but it's well, more, more upfront in other bridges, especially if we go back to the very beginning, the, the very slender arches, they, uh, of course, the, uh, this, when the, if I may say, the, the deck comes a bit more closer to the apex of the arch, of course, in, and uh, uh, this part has then be supported from this secondary uh, arches. All the UK bridges that I'm aware of failed. No, didn't fail structurally. They failed because um, road traffic loads increase, um, and so basically they just were inadequate. Right? But of course, there is a bridge of this design which is still in use every day uh, in the UK. Uh, there's the high level bridge in Newcastle, or the railway bridge, which structurally is almost identical to this, albeit the, the cassia sections are much heavier. Yeah. <clears throat> the, um, as far as I, I'm not aware of bridges being subject to patterns. I spent a lot of time designing bridges and patterns, strangely, compared with other technologies, patterns don't seem to come into the world of bridges like that. Never be really aware why, we just sort of keep clearly. <laughs> um, this, these bridges are unusual for two reasons to me. One is because they've been subject to a patent, and the other is because they've got strange, unnecessary side arches. And I think that the two factors tie into each other. You can only patent something if, if it is uh, clearly different. Mm -hmm. I don't think the side arches had any structural purpose. I think they were there simply to bamboozle the patent office. That this was something new and different that could be patented. <laughs> I do not know if at that time there was really uh, an examination of the patents which you have read. Uh, it was just to take date, but at that time it's, maybe it's the it was probably the beginning of the patents, which is later than in the UK. First, when I read the patent, and there is not much technical detail in it. It's even not said how these bridges were built. I assume they were built on the continuous center, of course. Uh, but it's, it's not really a technical problem. Um, the, there is a belief that cast iron take, can't take any tensile stress. Um, I've been looking into this recently. And um, a safe working stress is about two tons per square inch. And you can do quite a lot with that level of stress. Now, if you look at those side arches, they are actually doing a job. They're supporting the bits of the end of the bridge. Um, if you look at those uh, curved pieces, the lower cord of the um, the, those curved pieces, the, that is the bottom section, would be working in tension. The top section would be in uh, compression. Now, providing the stresses are not too high, but below the two tons per square inch, 
that would just be behaving like a uh, something which is trying to curb, pull out. Um, there would be no downward look, sorry, there would only be a vertical force downwards on the, um, the side pieces. And this explains something which initially puzzled me with your last slide, because it just looked so structurally bad, because you show how those in the last bridges, the, um, the pillars have been made of cast iron. And I thought, Jesus Christ, this is just going to crack over. But because the, you've got a vertical, simply a vertical downward force on those, they're perfectly safe. And those side arches are actually doing a job. They're not just there for the sake of it. Yes, besides, I should, and I come back to Peter's um, question. In fact, these are boussoirs made, um, if I understand correctly, in the pattern. Uh, the voussoir comprising about three rings. And the voussoir are assembled with the non and bolt. So if there is some tension, they will naturally the, 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 the joint will open. Of course this introduces some non-linearity, but it's a bit like in masonry, so the joints will simply open. The, the, the voussoirs are very much draw on Thomas Paine's uh, no. painting. The bridge uh, that was used at uh, Sunderland. Is this reminiscent of Thomas Yeah, it's very reminiscent of Thomas Wood's son. Yeah, yeah. Well, Thomas Wood's son. Yeah, yeah. 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 the, double, the double ring, Voussoir, yeah. was, was uh, Wilson's basic unit. Yeah. Um, Which was a slightly older origin. Yeah, that's right. I think Payne and Bedford, the Walker's Casper and Bedford. But it often, this is curiously old-fashioned. Yes. I mean, after all, the Thomas Wilson Bridge is the last one that's built, what, in 1815? And the Sunderland Bridge, which was much the most famous of them, is 1893. It's very old-fashioned, which is interesting. <laughs> it's almost like that he's also <coughs> using, he, he was taking a 30-year-old technology which had been found to, to uh, found wanted, and then basically patenting it to see if he could make money out of it. And also jumping into the point in which the French had severely lost confidence in suspension bridges. I mean, I have on my bedroom wall that enormous gloomy nexus in it, as you showed, with the collapse of the Angers Bridge. What is it doing? So, I mean, I, I, I always wondered what the French, at least I haven't gone into it, I always wondered what the French did once they decided they could no longer build suspension bridges, at least for a bit. And at least, I mean, he's in fact taking advantage of, yes. of, a, of, a, of a lacuna, if that's what I mean. And anyway, of a need, of a perceived need in the French bridge of the world. Um, I have heard that the building of suspension bridges uh, nearly halted after uh, this, for some years, mm -hmm. after this um, accident of 18, 1850, yeah. just, and it's, uh, but of course it took over after that. Yeah. Uh, well, they learned they, 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 But clearly it was an, an opportunity to propose something <coughs> else at that time, mm -hmm. so it, clearly it was speculation. And is that, I mean, the other thing I was wondering is that he was clearly accepted. By, by the Cordé Ponce Chaussée, yes. even though he had no training, whereas the Segas, much earlier, sort of 1840, you know, when they, when, they, when they built the first plan to run on suspension bridge, my memory is that they had the most awful trouble being accepted by the Cordé Ponce Chaussée yes. because they weren't real engineers, just like he wasn't a real engineer. Yes. So it says something about the changing approach of the Cordé Ponce Chaussée in 25-odd years. Yes, apparently uh, some engineers, member of the corps, senior engineers, the beginnings by Gérard de Gauvinvert and Vauclin, uh, supported this, this probability, changed the uh, changed problem. But there was a need to, to fail um, or to, to answer 
problem at that time, the lack of confidence into, into why it's a suspension of agency. Because as you know, in France, nearly all the suspension of agents were why a suspension of agents, not change suspension of agents. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the initial ID, yes, but it was certainly not, not a good manager. But do we know anything of his personality and what was his background before Bridges? We do not know. But um, um, what I, the only thing I know is that all the, his patents were in other businesses, and mostly related to manufacture and the young. Finding the mills, bit of uh, lighting, mm. like this. Uh, a bit of uh, two chateaux or something. <coughs> and who, an inventor who fits patents in any, any field. Uh, and it was certainly not very successful, not as <laughs> maybe some later. <laughs> But he charmed the aristocrats to yes. join his board. Yes. 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 <coughs> Sorry, one other question. You said that his deck had a very little longitudinal stiffness. Um, we can see it has cross beams. It did not have any deck beams, longitudinal deck beams. But there may be later addition on that post mm -hmm. uh, Um Because initially, it's a, it's, um, if I remember well, it's a kind of sheet, um, metal sheet inverted, filled with um, uh, stones. A uh, buckle, uh, like the yes, buckle. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Just sitting on the water and cross beams. <coughs> uh, there are probably... No, I just think uh, uh, there, there were experiences by this, by 20 years before this, there were serious Faded or serious problems with a couple of English bridges which did not have um, adequate longitudinal stiffness. I was thinking of the dredge descent from Bridge of Bath and so on. But it's, for me, it's quite clear that he had no education and absolutely he had never seen any um, material published about uh, the construction of bridges anyway, certainly not in the UK. So, but you would expect, of course, they shall sure say to know about it, but... I <laughs> mean, yeah. It's losing the time. <laughs> John, I could probably add a little bit on that. There is actually a newspaper description of the construction of the 1827 bridge in, in Leeds, where we have cast iron cross beams yes. from the hangars, mm -hmm. and they're all described as having been uh, load tested before. There are then relatively heavy longitudinal timber beams, a long lane on the top of those, and they seem, the indications are that they were fastened to the, the uh, cross beams. On the top of that, there is then a secondary transverse timber decking that was actually applied to basically as a, as a sacrificial uh, timber top deck. So it did. Even in, in 1827, they were thinking in terms of the lateral stability and the cross stability of it. How effective it would be, I don't think it would have been very effective, because there's no evidence of any diagonals within it. Mm -hmm. And there is certainly um, some indication of movement in these bridges when you look at the latest reports arguing for their replacement. I, I assume that we can confidently say that the design of the suspended deck was quite similar to the design of suspension, uh, deck of suspension, which was at that time in France. It was, uh, if this is similar to decks in, in the UK, I do not know. Uh, the Union Suspension Bridge yes. is virtually unchanged. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a great thing about suspension bridges right up really until the 1860s and I don't know if mention tips and suspension brief but that's sort of where it comes to <laughs> is that nobody 
they were all the early days, certainly in this country, and possibly also in France, they were obsessed with the strength of the iron and would it be able to support a deck. It never occurred to them to look at the deck as being part of an entire bridge. And the decks were, all of them, incredibly inadequate. And if you put your suspension bridge as Brown did across the Tweed, or in fact, as Telford did with the Conway Bridge, because if you were lucky enough to have a site with not very much wind loading, you know, with not much exposure to wind, then your suspension bridge survived, as indeed did Sandal and Brown and the Conway Bridge. But none of the early, none of the first generation suspension bridges in this country and in France, in this country, they didn't survive because in every single case, the decks collapsed. And it was really only the fire and Hawkshaw rethinking the design of their peak and suspension bridge in 1864 that they were able to build on this knowledge and they really got it. So the peak and suspension bridge survives because of the, of the understanding and the strength of its deck. I mean, this looks to me as flimsy as every single suspension bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I am. Considering this, uh, there is also another one which proved important in the story because in 1852 you had this uh, also a failure of the large suspension which in France at La Roche Bernard, oh, yes. the uh, La, La Vilaine River in mm -hmm. South Brittany. It was also about a 200 meter span and the deck, but it was a, a windy night with thunderstorm and the deck also failed. And this was just after the, or just at the moment of the test of the Vignon Bridge. That, so this was a, a second argument to promote this um, huge change of structure of time. So, but the maximum span that was apparently reached with these bridges was 65. This one is 31 meters. Let's go. This one? Yeah. Um, well, I've got a question, and I've also got uh, another question unrelated to this topic. Um, uh, the first one is once you get, the, once you get a certain uh, size span, isn't it very difficult to get the arch up without the risk of it, the arch actually breaking when you're doing it? And my second question is, have you done anything on the steel bridges, the welded steel bridges that were built in Belgium yes. in the uh, first half of this century that then broke up in the winter time? Have you done any yes. work on this? Yes. So that's two questions. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't uh, understand your first question. Can you summarize it? Okay. Well, when you when you are putting the arch up, yes. putting, when you are actually building the arch, isn't there a risk that the arch is not properly supported? That there's a risk because it's cast iron that that it will start fracturing. Once you reach a, 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 a big size, you know, it's difficult to support what you're putting up. It depends on the geometry and the stiffness of your table um, um, center. I so you would do it by centering? I assume it. I have, in, I have, in all the documents that I have read, uh, there is no mention whatsoever about the construction constructing modes of the method, method of erection that I assume it was on on center I cannot like the <coughs> masonry arches of that time. Uh, uh, I thought it might have been put up like they put up the um like the, the the bridge in uh, Australia the the um Sydney. the Sydney Humber Bridge. It's a kind of cantilever mm -hmm. method. Yeah. Building bridges using a cantilever system is much later. Yes. I mean, the Sunderland Bridge, there's a trunk, and I, know, I appreciated earlier, there's a terrific print 
and it's surely erected on timber century bit by bit, piece by piece, isn't it? Like our truth. Like our truth. Yeah. Um, so, yes. so what about these steel bridges in Belgium that bounce a bit? That's a, that's a completely different subject. <laughs> 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 That's a question of the introduction of um, electrical arc Yes, in Belgium in the 1920s. Um, and so it's interesting because so you have this bridge failure in March 1938 of the Assel Bridge. And last year, uh, there was a, an exhibition at the uh, Assel City Museum by an engineer yeah. of that city. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's a metallurgical engineer, but he lives in that city. And um, he did for his fellow uh, uh, inhabitants of Assel, he wanted to uh, have an exhibition on failure of this asset which in 1938 uh, because this failure is universally known as so somehow considered as the first well documented accident of little failure in pages. Um, and why is the so the city of Asel so well known outside <laughs> <laughs> for this failure and uh, that's uh, another subject that I uh, Worked on it uh, five or six years ago. Um, so, and interestingly, uh, so I published two papers on it. Um, um, one the paper I published in English was reissued uh, one month ago in the Journal of the Italian World Institute. Translated in Italian. So I could add also some bit of later information. So the big era, you may remember that it's also linked to a particular type of bridge that was mainly used in Russia, which is the VMP bridge or um, bridge without diagonals, only a type of frame, in fact, frame bridge quite internally stiff uh, from, so uh, it's a system which has been promoted since 1895 in Belgium, which, but which in fact did not met a lot of success before um, the beginning of the 1930s, so that's long span, beginning of 30 years. And, uh, but in very short time, five years, uh, about 50 of them were built to cross over the canal of the which was being built. That was our largest civil engineering project in Belgium at that time. So about you know, 50 crossings. And initially, they should have been uh, made in, uh, of course, still connected with up rivers. Uh, and some film days have been bridges before, but with Watch River team, they performed very well. But uh, in the late 1920s, the electrical, electrical arc building was introduced in Belgium. Uh, with a lot of research, but uh, what we know after this is that uh, we had not, of course, it was a bit experimental, but there were not enough specification concerning the, let's say, welding capabilities of characteristic of the, that steel. Because steel at that time, used in Belgium, was mostly steel, Thomas steel. Uh, yeah. It's kind of Besmer, but it's called Thomas, um, uh, Thomas, and and 
there are, I'm not going to really tell you the here, but they are, they are not as good as the Marta, as even smart as the Tukiga, because they are, uh, uh, the problem of Britain is induced by the nitrogen. Nitrogen, yes. But at that time it was not, really not well known by engineers. Only maybe some specialists did know that. The Would you be able to come back and give us a talk? <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, I think we should thank Professor Espion for a most excellent paper, and precisely we should invite him back to talk about uh, uh, Britain's uh, uh, failure. It's, it's my call. Yes. Uh, I, I, I run the London meetings. Would you come back and give us a talk? I didn't think these spots until 2020. <laughs> 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 On, on brittle failure of still early welded steel bridges. And Fred is smiling because I know that in the next Newcomen Links, our journal, there is a, a piece by Fred on an all welded steel bridge on the teeth side. So he has a particular interest in this. As we say in English street language, he's got four months in. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should thank Professor Espion for a most excellent evening and for a fascinating insight, exactly as John said. We don't know enough about European technology. We don't know enough about the history of engineering and technology amongst our neighbours. This has been a brilliant insight and a fascinating story. Thank you very much indeed.